Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, how do I control the view graphs? Oh, just the arrow buttons? Okay. Sorry, usually somebody pushes them for you, so I just, no, 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 no. <laughs> it is a pleasure to be here, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm hoping that uh, you'll enjoy what I have to say today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of walk you through where I think the Army may be going as we move into the, into the future. The Army's currently uh, going through a lot of deep, what they call deep future studies, trying to define what the Army needs to be. And along those lines, we're also trying to define what would the laboratory look like as, as the Army morphs towards the future directions. <clears throat> and, I, and I thought it would be uh, kind of useful to start rolling this out um, early on, and it might be of interest to the, to the audience uh, as we try and plan uh, you know, over the next several years of where research might be going uh, you know, across the country, especially in support of the Army. Uh, I, a lot of my conversations today with faculty members actually were about my previous job at AFOSR. Um, it has only been seven or eight months. Uh, if you want to talk about AFOSR, I'm happy to do that, but I'd like to try and keep it on the Army if possible during this session. So let me, uh, let me just start off with this. Um, every organization has a mission and a vision, and you know the laboratory was established 20 years ago in the Army through a consolidation of different activities to really create a foundational research group in support of all the Army missions. And so what we really focus on is the basic and what is often defined as the early applied research. And, and in the last 10 years, the, the calling has really been to actually think more near term, right? Because, you know, we've been at war and there are a lot of soldiers in harm's way. And because of that, the Army has reached into its laboratory system, uh, our sister laboratories, the Research Engineering Development Centers and the Army Research Laboratory, coming back with challenges saying, you know, we're running into this situation or we have this uh, issue that's come up. You know, what do we have that can solve current problems? And we've been doing this for a decade. So because we've been doing this for a decade, you know, we've got an entire generation of scientists and engineers at the laboratory who really get the purpose, the purpose of what it is that we do as a lab in support of the warfighter. But now the Army's asking us to, as we wind out a war, they're really asking us to kind of re-pivot back, you know, from where we were originally established and start addressing, you know, more of what is that discovery or that innovation? How do we really discover the next technologies, the next science areas that are important in supporting the Army? And then how do we innovate those? And so, you know, the laboratory as a whole is now moving towards this innovation aspect and where do we really discover and innovate. And of course, we always transition things in support of the, of the warfighter. And, and I put this bumper sticker on here because I think it's an interesting discussion we could have, um, you know, maybe later or whatever. But we, we create a laboratory system in the Department of Defense to really compete with today's technologies in the Department of Defense. I mean, that's really our purpose. And so since I'm at the Army Research Laboratory, I've specifically stated here that, you know, my job and the RDEX job within the Art Research Engineering Development Command is really to make tomorrow, today's and, and the next Army's obsolete. And we do that because that's what our adversaries are attempting to do, right? We have the most technologically advanced Army in the world. We have the most technologically advanced Navy and Air Force. And our adversaries are actually trying to figure out how do we actually overcome that technological advantage that the services have. And so who does that for the services? Who ensures that the, depart the department brings, to f brings forward the best technology that exists in the world? And it really occurs through the laboratory system. We do it in our partnerships. We don't do it alone. We do it in our partnerships with the academic community and the, and the industry, small businesses and large businesses. But really that foundation occurs from this self-competition that occurs within the department. And the reason it works this way is because the department's actually a monopoly. We're not a competitive business. And so it needs an internal unit to actually try and push those frontiers to ensure that we move technologies into the industrial base, which then comes back to the department and new technologies. And so that's really what this bumper sticker is all about. It's really about the fact that the science and technology programs of the department are really generating new capabilities into the future. And we as a laboratory are moving back more and more to looking long-term of where the Army needs to go. Um, 
I have a couple of UGRAFs that are always required. So um, the way the Army structured is there actually is divided into two areas. The top half of this UGRAF really defines the policy part of Army Science and Technology. It's run under the Honorable Heidi Hsu, and she's the acquisition executive. And so she sets guidance and direction of where the Army needs to be investing in science and technology programs. And since she's come on board, she's really trying to get the Army to focus. She has gone to the PEOs and PMs, the people that do the acquisition, and she's asked them, what's your 30-year plan? I'm not sure they've done 30-year plans in a long time. So she made them go through 30-year 30 30 roadmaps. What are the technologies you need in the acquisition world over the next 30 years? Not over the next budget cycle, but over the next six or seven budget cycles. And that's a major shift in philosophy and culture in an organization. Along those lines, they're now starting to shape what are some of the areas we need to actually work in. And so that's executed in the bottom half of this view graph. And so we're under what's called the Army Material Command. And all the S&T in the Army Material Command is about 72%. That's executed in the Research Development Engineering, Engineering Command, which is already ECOM. And then that's executed in these six, seven, did I count right? Seven organizations. The Army Research Laboratory, which is actually the lab for across the entire spectrum, not just RDECOM. And then, uh, you know, more mission oriented organizations like aviation and missiles <coughs> or CAMBIO, which is up at Edgewood. And so we do this as a, as a collaborative effort. <clears throat> so the way that business model works, and I, I only go through these couple of view graphs because every service is different. There's a diversity in the way we approach the problems. And if you want to work with the different services, it's useful to actually have at least a little understanding of how we structure ourselves and how we actually work. So I won't go through all the details. This is a 20-minute discussion on the view graph if you go through everything, believe it or not. But the way it's really structured is we have these PEOs and PMs on the right-hand side here in the green. They do acquisition for the Army. But they don't actually have an engineering workforce. They have a small engineering workforce. And, and they need engineering support for all the systems. And they actually buy that through what's called matrixed. So there are a large number of engineering employees in the, in the research and engineering development centers that actually provide the direct support to the acquisition community. And that's so that the acquisition community has a very fresh look at what the engineering is as an organization. Similar, and, and, their, and their mission is really to focus on how do I do advanced development? How do I take things that have been innovated and start to develop those technologies and support where I now know because I'm matrixed into the PEOs and PMs where their gaps are, where are the things they need to do as an organization. So what ARL does is it really extends the bench of those RDEX, right? So we have that technical workforce that they rely back into as a way to actually gain additional technical expertise. And what isn't shown on here because it's only drawn under ARL is I have the Air Army Research Office as part of my organization, and that's really extending the bench to you. So the academic community is really my extended bench. So I have 2,000 government, 1,000 contractor employees doing research in the Army Research Laboratory, and then I have an extended bench to the broader academic community so that we can actually start looking at problems together to solve where the future will be for the Army. And so that's why I think it's important to understand well, where might the Army be going, because I need your support as that extended bench to actually make this enterprise be successful. Just like the RDEX need us as their extended bench, and just like the acquisition people need the RDEX as their extended bench. And that's how the Army has structured itself. The other departments have done it differently, but this gives us an ability to have some fluidity all the way from reaching into the academic community all the way to those acquisition systems. So when we're in the war, like we've been the last 10 to 12 years, we have had lots of reach back all the way to the academic community to help solve those problems. And now that we're rolling out a war, we have the reach back capability so we can work with you to try and create what the next future army is going to look like. And that's really going to be the focus of what my, my presentation is about. Um, just to give you an idea what the business model is to run the laboratory, it is, uh, we execute about $1.3 billion at research. We also do about $800 million of direct site. A lot of that we do for DARPA. We can talk about that another time. What's on the left is really tells you how the money flows in. 
What's in the middle is where we are going to start defining what I'll call campaign plans of science. And we'll go through this in a little more detail, but we've laid out what are the eight or so areas that we need to start really defining what's a campaign. You know, if I want to do computational sciences as the Army, you know, how do I build that pyramid of that campaign? What's the science I need to do to drive that solution set in the, in the computational sciences? And then on the right is how I execute that program. So the top three boxes are really my engagement with academia. So we do that through the single investigator programs, the university research initiatives like MURIs. Um, we have UARCs, collaborative alliances. We have one here that you're a partner in in the, uh, in the MAST program. That's to really bring together that extended bench, right? The business model here is I have a research staff. How do I extend that bench and work collaboratively with you using these collaborative research alliances? So I execute in-house, and then I have an industrial partner. So we execute a lot of small business. How do we move that IP into the industrial base? Because the fact of the matter is, as a research laboratory, one of the things we can't measure very effectively, but we do all the time, is we give away our intellectual property. If we were a competitive business, we would never give it away. But that's not the way we're structured, right? Because remember, my job is to make the Army of the future and make today's Army obsolete. And, and just to give you an example, so when we went into Afghanistan, I'm sorry, into Iraq, and we had the IED problem with MRAPs, there was no armor. So the Army came back and said, how do we fix the armor problem? And because of the history of ballistics work that's been done at the laboratory, in the armor work that had been done at the laboratory, we came up with a recipe that actually protected the MRAPs. We didn't have the manufacturing capability and neither did industry. We actually gave that recipe to the industrial base and said, if you make this material, we can put it on the MRAP and save lives. And three companies picked it up. Two actually made the exact same recipe we did as the Army. A third modified it. But we created that industrial base in six months so that we could actually up armor MRAPs. That's the kind of things that we do. And we did that with some of our industry, our academic partners, trying to come up with these recipes based on our experience and your experiences. And that's how we actually meet those emerging and urgent needs. All right, so there's lots of talk. Let's talk about where, where, where the Army might be going because, you know, it's still a little fluid. We all get lots of guidance. You don't have to read the eye chart. I get it from the Department of Defense. I get it from the Army. I get it from Congress, you know, I get it from you. I get more advice than I could ever imagine or figure out how to answer, and I definitely don't have enough dollars to actually answer all the advice I get, okay? So we gotta figure out how we're gonna move forward. And, and so I thought, well, I'll show you another example. I got this from Ms. Shu. She gives this presentation, and she calls it her pyramid. And it's really, and I, I think it's important to understand why I put this in here, because we have an acquisition executive who today tells the chief and secretary, you know, the seed corn of S&T is really the foundations of your systems, the systems in the future. And she has convinced them that this is really an investment they need to be committed to. And I won't even pretend to be able to present this view graph, except for the fact that I think we ought to just look at it. She understands there's a foundation. There's a scientific and engineering foundation of everything we eventually field. And if we lose that foundation, we won't be able to feel what we need to field in the future. All right, so the Army has actually started what they call a campaign of learning. And, and they're really trying to define what does an Army look like in 2040? And, and then how do you get there? And so you can do this two ways. You can say, I have an army of today, and then I let it evolve, and what's it look like in 2040? Or you can say, this is the army I need in 2040, and you work your way backwards to determine how do I get there. So, but you can't forget about today. So we have an army that's a lot different than what we used to have, right? So we have an army that's empowered and integrated. So it sounds funny, but it's digital, right? So in the 90s, we digitized the army. We provided information to the soldier at the tactical edge, situational, aware, situational awareness. That was a major advancement in the 90s. And so they, you know, now we've empowered them to make decisions. They still have problems because if they really want to engage, they still have to call back and ask permission a lot of times. 
But what do you really want in the future? You want something that's more robust. You want something that's agile. You, you really want something that can be independent, that can rapidly change in this world that's changing. And that's not the army we have today. So how do you get there? So I, I stole this from TRADOC, which is our Training and Doctrine Command, because I think it's actually a, an interesting discussion. And this is really a presentation which was provided to both the Chief and the Secretary. I made one modification. Major General Hicks presents this uh, presentation. He has a picture up there from one of his friends. Uh, basically, it's a Little League picture. And he focuses on what my military member is going to be over the next couple of years. So that picture ends up being my platoon leader in 2025, my company commanders in 2030, my battalion commanders in 2040. That's the person we're really trying to reach. That's the person you're trying to prepare for this 2040. What I did is I actually chose one of our middle school classes that came to ARL as a STEM activity to try and get kids interested in STEM. The fact of the matter is that's really the people we need to really focus on at the moment. Because on the bottom of this, they become my scientists and engineers in 2025. They become my scientists and engineers in 2030, and they become my scientists and engineers in 2040. So the science we do today is the science that we're going to have to apply in the future. You're training people today to be the people that are in the system that can solve the problems when things get broken with the new technologies we're creating today. So it's not about us in the room. Most of us won't be here. It's about this group of individuals. And I would argue that I need platoon leaders and eventually battalion commanders who are STEM cognizant. So even if they don't go to college and they get recruited in the military, if we have a more technological force, regardless of whether it's the Army, the Air Force, or the Navy, they have to be STEM cognizant. They have to be able to understand technology because if they don't, when we hand them technology, they're not going to know how to use it. The fact of the matter is they won't use it. So this is the group we need to focus on together. I know you have STEM programs here. I can't tell you how impor important they are. Not whether they become STEM, but just getting them interested in understanding the value of STEM, the value of mathematics in life in general is really important. All right, so what the other thing this does is that the top hour here says, if I take today's army and I evolve it and I go to 2040, I know it can't do the mission. And if that's the case, I've got to do something different. So the chief and secretary and Ms. Hsu have bought off on this. So with the sequestration you hear about, with the budget cuts you hear about, or reductions potentially, Unless things change you know, during these budget cycles and discussions, the Army is going to take a pause on acquisition. It's going to buy less material at the expense of maintaining science and technology. Right? This is a profound difference, right? We've never done this before. We've always said, I can always defer my science and technology investments. But that's not what the Army plan is at the moment. The Army plan is we're going to buy less material. We're going to invest in science and technology. So eight or nine years from now, I will have new things to purchase because I know I need to follow the bottom half of this chart, not the top half of this chart. And so TRADOC starting to define what are areas, what are called deep future studies, what are areas we need to focus on as an Army. And that's what's in the box here on the bottom, and they call them lines of effort. But it's really about, if I go study, what do I need to do? I need to enhance human performance. It's really about a human dimension. It, you know, do I, do I need better information to decision? So you hear a lot of people talk about big data. It's, big data is a small part of a bigger problem, right? It's really about how do I sense, collect, fuse, extract, represent, and provide to a person to make a decision. It's not just about the big data problem. Because I need ultimately, in the end, you need somebody who's going to actually decide something. So I won't go through all those, but those, those are really starting to drive directions. So where do we fit in in some of this? So, so these are the same topics from TRADOC. 
And, you know, the assistant secretary, you know, the acquisition level has portfolios. And what we're really doing is we're working with TRADOC to define that future state, us and, and the RDEX. And then on the bottom here, we're working with ASOL. How do you really shape the portfolio to address those future states? And that's what leads us into the campaigns, right? So as a laboratory, we need to start deciding, you know, if, if those are the defined spaces that the Army needs to be different in the future, how do I start defining scientific strategies to help that? I don't know what the answers are. This is not about a capability. It says if I have a human dimension, what are the things in human sciences I will need to lay out as an organization? Or if I have this problem, information to decision, what are the information sciences I need to work on? Network, cyber, data fusion, cybernetics for representation of how I actually represent information to people and how I integrate. And, and so you can go through this list. There are some cross cuttings. The extramural, intramural, I mean the extramural, the basic research aspects are on the left, which really feeds this. And then there are some cross cutters here, which are really the computational sciences, materials research, and then we do a lot of assessment and analysis. So how do we bring this all together and how do we lay out a strategy? And I don't have the strategy for today. This is what we're actually trying to do as an organization at the moment, is you know, how do we define that strategy and how do we align the programs to start addressing those strategies? And I don't see a clock in the room, so will somebody wave at me when we get to like 10 minutes to, or I don't know. All right, so why do you do, why do you want to have this kind of a strategy, right? So I think what we're really trying to do is create, you know, foundations for the new disruptive technologies to solve some problems that are formerly unsolved, right? That's, that's what we're trying to do. And, and I think there are really six goals as a laboratory, which is really to try and strengthen the research program. So if we define these areas, it's really about, it's really about you know, providing scientific leadership, right? So how do we actually provide leadership to say, these are the directions you need to go as an organization? And then how do we bring this to this collaborative research enterprise to show you the directions we need to go, to help you understand as an entity you know, what areas of science we need to focus on to solve these problems and engage you. We have some workshops going on right now where we're engaging the academic community and trying to define what are some of the special things one might actually do in, let's say, quantum information sciences or intelligent systems. Probably the number one thing we need to do is attract the best science, scientists and engineers, you know, to contribute to this area. So I don't really care if they come work for me. What I do care about is that the people that we are putting into the system in this collaborative activity work somewhere in the system to support where we need to go as an organization. So when I went to graduate school, my plan was to be a tandem mass spectrometrist. I went to Delaware to work with Bernie Munson, who invented chemical ionization mass spectrometry. I was planning on going to DuPont I even had a job offer from DuPont. But you know, I got to graduate school and I was offered to come work in the summer by my advisor who was not Bernie Munson. And I spent three months working the summer instead of flipping burgers. And I, uh, I changed my entire career out of focus. And that was a summer research grant, not even a grant for my PhD, but summer research grant from the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. And then I got funded for my PhD by the Air Force, and I went to the Navy to work, not the Air Force. But you never know where people end up, because then I came back and I ran the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. And by the way, to do my PhD, I used equipment at the old Ballistics Research Laboratory, which I manage today. All right, so you don't know where people could end up. What you want to do is you want to feed them into the system so they can be part of the overall enterprise. All right, so there's got to be coherence and balance. Uh, there's got to be connectivity, right, between the researchers, the Army community, let them understand what it is we're trying to do, how do we work together. We really have to maximize this discovery potential and the innovation in trying to create the future and then try and, you know, uh, push out any transitions along the way that will support where the Army wants to go. So let's talk about each of these areas a little bit. That's, that's what, I'm, what I've committed myself to do. There are two of these we haven't even scoped to this level, so I, I, will, I will skip those. That's uh, computational sciences, and I don't remember the other one, but we'll figure that out in a minute. 
So in the extramural basic research program, what I've done is I've, well, let me back up. So these view graphs are laid out in, in two halves. And so the first half on the, your left basically kind of tells you what we're trying to do in our basic research program and our collaborative program. Then it tells you, and it's a little different here for basic research, we're interested in, in foundations and the disciplines. And in our collaborative research areas, I identify for you some of the areas we think are important to have better funda fundamental understandings and is extending the bench of my laboratory. And we do these through these collaborative partnerships, and MAST is one of those, but it's probably listed under Maryland as opposed to, uh, as opposed to uh, Michigan because I think it's actually a Maryland-led activity. Is that right? I don't really know. BAE led. BAE led. Oh, so it says BAE there. There you go. Okay, you're right. So it's a BAE led, so it says BAE, not Maryland. Okay. All right, so what I thought I'd then do is identify for you in these topic areas just a little bit of a snapshot, and I won't go through them all because we will run out of time. But, you know, what kind of comes out of a program like this? And I'll do this for each of these areas. And so the bottom is always the transition. This is what we're providing. If you think of the arrow chart I gave you, this is what I'm providing today. The middle is what I'm providing for the 2020 time frame, between today and 2020. And the top is really what you're providing for 2030. The fact of the matter is technology is moving at a pass, pace so fast today that we're probably underestimating how quickly we can move things through the system. Because what we've seen technologically the last 20 years will probably happen in the next seven years because it's moving at such a rapid pace. So even though I tell you that's probably 2030, probably more like 20, 25, and this stuff will just come through the system faster. All right, so the bottom starts out with a single investigator program from Aero to MIT looking at uh, omnidirectional mirrors. Through this collaborative partnership with the UARC, with the ISN, the Institute of Soldier Nanosciences, uh, Yul Fink's group actually pulled fibers which were hollow so you could pass CO2 lasers through fibers. And so, you know, this is then got transitioned to OmniGuy, which is a small company. And so this is now a surgical procedure for doing laser cutting and surgery. It's used by 2,000 hospitals across the United States. It's actually used at Walter Reed in, in actually providing surgical support for soldiers when they come home out of out of theater. All right, so this is just a, an example of something that you know started out in a single investigator, works through our partnerships, has actually is currently being used today on a regular basis. Um, middles, you know, activities that, I, you know, I saw some here too, you know, negative index, metamaterials, a lot of possibilities there. Some metamaterial work is already uh, showing up in antennas. Uh, so even saying 2020, as I mentioned, is, is probably reaching too far out in time. It's much more here. Uh, and I know there's some nuclear spin uh, work going on here at, at Michigan. This is happening a lot of places. Uh, and, that, and that's uh, you know, some work at University of Washington. And then I got asked today about 2D materials during some of our conversation. Yeah, we're interested in 2D electronics. You know, whether it's graphene, it, it doesn't matter. And we're actually also interested in stackable materials. Can I actually stack and tailor the, uh, you know, the, the band gaps of these materials and the plasmonics? There's a lot of potential, you know, interesting things that can be done with these materials in the future. All right, so uh, I picked one example. There's way too many areas that we do. So if I go back to the view graph before, one of those, the third one down in research areas for basic research was life sciences. And so to give you an idea of how we are structuring the program, uh, in the life sciences area, on the right here is what we do in-house by more organizations. On the left are the collaborators we're actually trying to build in this partnership. Right. So I believe as we move forward as an entity that we have to build the partnership much stronger if we're going to be more successful. And so these partnerships need to start being more than just, you know, interesting engagements. They need to really be truly collaborative activities where researchers from the laboratory <coughs> come to places here like Michigan and people from Michigan come to my lab and we work collaboratively on topics together. So it just gives you an idea is that we've started the structure of the portfolio. The Muries are being driven this way, the single investigator programs, our UARCs, 
and our CTAs and CRAs. And there's a host of things that, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff on neuroscience and, and uh, you know, there's some work in translation on neuroscience to an fMRI to understand cogni cognition that we do with the uh, Institute of Collaborative Biotechnologies and EEG measurements so you can actually look at how people make cognitive or subconscious decisions so they can a we can actually monitor and understand how humans and machines interface. So that just gives you that. So that's the setup for the rest of these view graphs uh, as we go through because I'll try not to take too much time going on. So human sciences. So human sciences is really about, you know, gaining a fundamental understanding of the warfighter performance. How do you enhance it? How do you provide training aids? How do you do man-machine interactions, integrations? And this is an important one. We often don't think about the soft sciences, the human sciences. But one of the reasons this is important is because ethically, we will not augment humans to perform more effectively. Meaning, you know, we will not provide unethical assistance. Our adversaries might. So you've got to figure out a way to assist the human to be more effective. That's why the human machine interface, the cybernetics world, really becomes very important. How do I give the human an advantage in a world where they may not, they may come up against people that are augmented and are, are given ways of enhancing their performance that we would never do as a country? Because that's a possibility. All right? So, you know, this also gets you into the social world. How do you, it's social cybernetics. How do you understand, you know, cognitive aspects? Um, I list on the bottom here our partners, which I forgot to mention. We work with a lot of people, the Ardex, the universities, the CTAs fit into these activities. Things that we've transitioned, you know, for today's fight, trying to do, uh, you know, IED uh, training. So you can actually do mobile IED training. There's a 3D display that a soldier looks at today before he goes in where he can actually go through a scenario looking at footprints in the sand, how things have been disrupted and moved so they can understand what they're looking for before they actually get into theater. We're doing, with the ICT out at Santa Barbara, out at the USC, we're doing immersive technologies where people can put on heads up displays and can actually be immersed in the environment so you can actually train individuals. Um, there's even PTSD uh, work that's being done there where they can get virtual um, assistance or you actually put them back in the environment when they're actually talking to, a, to a, a, a psychiatrist when they're trying to get through PTSD because they'll relive the scenarios, which will help them actually get through the, the, the counseling much faster than they do if they don't because they actually feel like they're back in the environment. Those are the kinds of things that are really coming in the training and virtual world for our soldiers. All right, so there's a lot of stuff in, you see, you know, exoskeletons. I mean, you can see a lot of work being published in exoskeletons. And, and truthfully, what we really need in exoskeletons or in a broader topic in my mind is what I would define as intelligent systems. What you really need is you need to be able to assist the soldier. You need to be able to assist the soldier with a system that intelligently knows what, the soldier, what a soldier needs. So it needs to be able to sense what the soldier's needs are. So if you build an exoskeleton, that's great, but how do I know how to help that person actually continue his performance? It needs to be able to measure the person's biomimetics so they can understand and assist. I might want to create a heads-up display, which we hear about for F-22 pilots and stuff, but I'd like to see a helmet that gets put on that knows when it gets put on, it knows what person put it on. So that the representation of the information actually is represented in a way that is maximized for that person. Right? Because what we do in the services, we look at the standard person, right? So we, if you look across the room, I don't know what you define as the standard person in this room, but we define the soldier as a standard person, including men and women. It's only been recently that we have a different standard for women than we have for men. So women would go into theater with, with body armor that was made for men, and they couldn't actually you know, when they would lay down and do stuff, it didn't fit. It's only been the last two years that we built body armor designed for women. But look at us. We don't look the same. We don't have the same body shapes. We don't think the same. 
There's a multiplier here if we can figure out a way to take advantage of the diversity instead of pushing everything into the standard person category. We don't know how to do that. There's a lot of science in trying to actually figure out how do you take advantage of the diversity as opposed to the individual, making everybody be the same. All right, and I've already mentioned some of this uh, brain-based neurotechnologies. What you're seeing here, just as an example, this is a place we're measuring EEGs uh, at the laboratory, and you can flip through photographs on real photographs on a, on a computer, ask the person to identify friend or foe. They don't touch anything. They just sit there, and through the EEG signals, you can actually identify which are friend and which are foe. So it's a completely new way of actually interacting with machines so that you don't actually have to do the physical touching of, of the instruments. Um, <clears throat> again, just like I did before, a whole, and these are available to anybody, you know, the, the in-house activities, social cognitive networks, human robot intera interactions, and our collaborators. So this is why we have all these CTAs, CRAs, the UARCs, so we can start bringing together a very diverse team of individuals to look at it, at these areas. So this is one subset of the human sciences. How do I really look at soldier performance? So information sciences. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of things going on here. I think that, you know, I've seen, but I'll give you a couple of things that maybe you don't know the Army does. So the bottom left here, this multicolored picture, this is actually uh, regional weather. So the Army actually does weather predictions at the meter scale. Not, and I, I came from the Air Force, so I thought all the weather was done by the Air Force Weather Center. It turns out that that's not the case. All the local weather is actually done by the Army and is fed into the, you know, the Air Force Weather Center for predicting weather. So why is that important? Because when you're in, the, in a very local environment, even the ballistics and understanding the weather for ballistics is really important. The communications, when you go down the list, you really need a high resolution weather predictive capability. So if you want to get in a contested environment, and, and you know, there's a lot of discussions about contested environments. What, you know, how do you do communications without, you know, uh, in, in wavelength regions that are non-traditional? So the, the one on the middle here on the left is really some UV communications work we're doing, bouncing UV off clouds, as an example. And then, you know, things that aren't on this view graph in the quantum information sciences, I get a lot of questions. Well, why does the Army care about quantum information sciences? And, and my opinion is, is that the country that actually solves the second quantum revolution has an economic advantage over the rest of the world. It will have that profound of an impact. For us, it's because in the information space, we have a network that's different than anyone else's. Which I also get a lot of questions. Why is the Army in network sciences? Why is the Army care about cyber? Because everybody else is caring about these problems too. So if I couple those together, what the Army has today is it has a tactical network. So think about our network. Every one of you would be a node. And in theater, it wouldn't only be you, it would be every sensor system you have, every weapon system you have. So there'd be about 10,000 of you in a local region, wireless, not airborne, you have terrain problems, it's highly dynamic, there's very little bandwidth, and I expect you to push data, comms, and social networking over three separate networks so that you individually have all that information in, in real time. And it's dynamic, so your signal will come and go randomly based on where you're at. So there is no one else with that network problem. And the reason I couple these two together is because when I was talking to General Walker at TRADOC, he asked me, he said, well, I forget how he worded it, but it was about the network we'll have in 2040, and he was relating it to the network we discussed today. And my answer to him was, I don't think the network you have today is a network you'll have in 2030 or 2040. The fact is, I wouldn't be surprised if we have a quantum network by then. Because we already can do teleportation of data through the air with, you know, a line of sight at 90 some kilometers in a secure fashion. So why would we think that in 2030 we'll be working with a regular wireless network? But the Army has a unique network 
And so I think we need to couple these together. I need to be able to understand information at what I would define as the tactical edge. And then I also need to think about what that ne next network might be so I can prepare the Army for the future network. All right, again, I, uh, you know, same view graph, just to let you know how we're trying to partner this together. I have an in-house capability. There's a whole host of areas that we work in the network sciences. Everything from dynamic networks, polymorphic networks, things that people traditionally do. But again, the twist here is that it's at this tactical edge. It's, uh, you know, and, and we've set up systems to our, our collaborative activities specifically to address these problems. In fact, as I think uh, just announced last week or the week before was a cyber CRA, which was with Penn State and Carnegie Mellon uh, University to try and bring in another collaborative partner to work in this area of cyber and network sciences. And again, if you look at the activities, this case we actually have an activity with the UK. So we have a collaborative alliance in network and information sciences with the UK where they fund UK <coughs> universities and businesses, and we fund UK, uh, US university businesses. We work collaboratively together to solve information science problems and network problems together. So to me, this is the future. If you haven't figured this out, this is the way we have to work together, right? We can't work as independent entities anymore. We have to figure out a way to turn this into an ecology, an ecosystem that works robustly together, openly together. And that's the only way we're really going to actually solve these problems. And we can plan out what it's going to be like in, in 30 years and solve challenges that we don't know how to solve today. Uh, and lethality and protection, this happens to be my background, so I'll try not to spend too much time on it, but it's the one I know the most. Um, there are simple things that one would think that we had done in the past. So the bottom one here is actually, a, it's called an M855A1 small arms munition. It's just a, you know, it's a pistol munition. It's a round out of a munition. You know, prior to about a couple years ago, we never did any ballistic studies on small arms. Surprised me. Uh, we, we had no idea how they worked. They've been in use, I don't know how long small arms have been in use, but probably a couple centuries, right? And, and we really have no idea how small arm <coughs> ballistics actually work. So this is actually a, uh, an activity which was done to really look at the fundamental ballistics. And then that round was actually made in what's called a PIF. It's a, a prototype you know, facility. And so another thing one needs to think about, and I'll use this view graph as an example, is that so in our RDEC partners, they have PIFs because industry doesn't want to make 100 of anything. They don't want to make the first prototype. They don't want to you know, figure out you know, whether or not these pieces or parts are actually useful. Somebody has to fill that niche. And so the Army is Setting, has set up facilities here at Tardec, which is nearby. Yeah, this was done at Ardec, which is in New Jersey. So we can make small scale quantities of these, learn how to make them, teach industry how to make them. There are now somewhere on the order of 8 million rounds of this, which have been produced in industry. But it only occurred because we actually had a production prototyping capability within the laboratory. And so that kind of an activity, I think, can be done. We do it in electronics. We do it in, a lot in plastics, we do it in metals, we do it in vehicles. And, and that's something that I think we can bring to this partnership as a, as a community. As you develop technologies, we can help prototype them through a lot of our other laboratories. We can help you prototype and understand are these actually viable. Because remember, if we're going to take an acquisition hiatus, we really want to prototype things so we understand them and we need to put them on the shelf that eight years from now, you know what's doable and what's not doable. And I don't know if that's something that the universities want to do, but we're willing to do that as part of the partnership. The only one I'll mention here in Discovery is because this is actually sort of near and dear to my heart. So this is, uh, this is work that friends of mine did. I didn't do this. I, I had friends of mine at Livermore and Carnegie Institute made poly CO. If you guys are high pressure diamond anvil, sell people like I was. Um, you know, poly CO means you can take CO gas, press it hard enough, it turns into a solid. And back in the early 90s, when I was doing this kind of work, and we released the pressure, it turned back into a gas. 
And it turns out the researcher, a young lady who came to us from the Carnegie Institute, is doing high pressure uh, on these materials. And it turns out the reason it does that is because it has helium impurity in it, because you have to use helium to cool it to actually uh, compress CO gas. You get rid of the helium impurity, you can actually recover solid CO, polymorph, polymorphic CO. You can either get it in an amorphous solid or you can get it as a crystalline solid. So it's a completely new class of extended solid energetic systems. So if you do traditional chemistries of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, there really isn't much more energy you can put into the system. But if you actually do poly CO or poly nitrogen, extended solids, you can actually put in a lot more energy. Challenge of this is it only survives for about two and a half weeks, and then it goes back to being CO gas. But it's an area that people have been working on. The metallic hydrogen community was remarkable metallic hydrogen probably since the you know, late 70s, early 80s. And it's, it's only been recently that we've been able to successfully do this. Long-term investments, just developing the techniques to try and get to these pressures and recoverable. Uh, I, I, I've gone through this, and I think I was given a 10 minute, or a couple minutes ago, so I won't go through all these. Again, partnerships in the energy. This is again one subset: of lethality and and uh, protection sciences. And you know, people we work with in this area, we do a lot more with the national laboratory systems and others. This is an area there is not a large uh, academic community in, in energetics and propulsion. We've sort of decimated this community as a nation over the last several years, over the last 15 years. You know, I, I don't know what we can do to try and fix it. I do think it would be great if we could actually get more academics back involved in this, in this work, again, as we move forward. I'm not saying that we'll create programs, but I'd be, I'm, I'm an advocate. It's something that we, uh, we need to think of as, as a nation. Um, material science. Um, A lot, of, a lot of interesting stuff. Down here is a quantum well infrared uh, detector, room temperature IR, has zero quantum efficiency, but uh, KK Choi had actually developed a, a corrugated system so you can actually do room temperature IR now. And I don't remember what the quantum efficiency is, but it basically exceeds today's infrared detectors that are cooled. This is actually being flown by NASA on a satellite now to do infrared imaging. So a, a, a technique that was, it was transitioned. Again, key areas of research, you can, you can look through on all those activities, uh, a lot of new electronics, biological sciences, uh, you know, materials in extreme environments. I get a lot of questions of why do the services care about material science? Why can't I just go buy it from someone else? And the answer is, is that the clothing I wear and you wear will not survive in theater. That's my easiest example. The materials we put in theater go into a much more harsh environment than what the commercial industry is willing to provide. And, it, and it's also in, a, in an environment that has lots of threats. And so materials in extreme environments means what we're really looking at is we're trying to move beyond the commercial industry. So how do I make textiles that survive? Because a soldier wouldn't survive in this uniform in, in theater. And so it's really about how do you ex extend the material science uh, to the other. And this here is some of the ceramic work that I was mentioning for armor. And again, I picked uh, structural and electronic materials this time. We have another collaborative research alliance really about doing multi-scale, trying to really have predictive capabilities and design of electronics. This is with John Hopkins University and a host of other partners. And, and again, it's about bringing this ecology together so we can really solve these challenging problems. Uh, I have a test group that does methodology development. We won't do a lot of activity, uh, you know, in assessment analysis. We do a lot of what's called man print. You design a lot of technologies. The question then is how does a human use them and are they effective for the human? And the top one here, you know, I just thought I'd throw out there as a methodology development. This is a ballistic impact of a lithium ion battery. So people were thinking about putting them in tanks. Of course, we had the 787 fires lithium ion batteries. Uh, the fire isn't bad enough to really do anything to the tank. The problem is the toxic fumes would kill everybody in the tank. And, and nobody bothered to really sit down and do the assessment and analysis. That's some of what we do because we've tied some, a small portion of the test community to the laboratory so they can extract 
things that we're doing in the lab to apply them to the test community so they have a better understanding of the fundamentals in the assessments. All right, uh, I can wrap up real quick here. So we have a talented workforce. You know, there's about 50% PhDs in, in my science and engineering workforce. The, the skill sets are changing because we're moving in new directions. And, you know, we, things that are important to us right now are quantum sciences, what I defined as intelligent systems, the information at the tactical edge, uh, materials in extreme environments, and biological sciences as five as an example. And we're seeing adjustments in our portfolios to address those types of areas because the Army has decided these are areas where we think we need future investments. So I'm looking to recruit neurological sciences. Oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot one. Cybernetics, the concept of the human machine, taking human machine interactions together. Uh, we're looking for more neuroscientists. We, we had one two years ago. We now have 10. Most of them came through our CRA partnerships. Postdocs who are actually coming working in our labs who are actually at UC Santa Barbara who now have jobs at, at the laboratory. So we're interested in building, you know, the next generation workforce through these partnerships as well. I have a lot of great recognized workforce just like uh, we do here across the academic communities. I have a unique technical infrastructure. We, we won't go through all this uh, details. I have a clean room, uh, special electronic materials facility, which is very similar to what's uh, over in the other building. Um, we have visualization labs, high performance computing. But the one I think is maybe a, a way to kind of represent what's most important here is, is this bottom one here that says access to partner facilities. These partnership relationships provide us access to your facilities and you access to our facilities. So it's, it's about the people, the exchange of the human capital. It's about leveraging each other's infrastructure so we can maximize the potential of the investments. And then uh, I think that's my next last one. So corporate outreach, we do a lot of, we do a lot of uh, STEM outreach, just like you do. And, I, and I've already pitched to you why. Right? I'm, you know, I think the STEM pipeline is, is fairly healthy. I don't want to get into a debate over that. Had a little discussion today at lunch. But I think what we often forget about is uh, this group down here on the bottom is the future that we're talking about. Even if I can't make them be STEM students, let's at least make sure they recognize the value of science and mathematics and how it impacts their lives. Each and every one of us has an opportunity to do that. And let's not just reach out to the high schools and middle schools within a 10 minute drive of where we work. So when we did the first s &E festival on the mall, if you know what that is, they did a big science and engineering festival on the mall down in DC. The organizer, organizer that came to see me when I, was in, uh, when I was at AFOSR, and he was telling me all the great things they were doing, busing kids to get exposure to what was going on. And he was gonna run a bus from TJ, Thomas Jefferson High School in the Washington DC area, which is like one of the top science and engineering schools in the country. And I asked him, I said, well, what impact do you think you're gonna have? Aren't they already interested in STEM? Well, yeah, but we want to get them down to get this experience. I said, well, how about the kids out in Culpeper County? I know you don't necessarily know the geography, but we're talking an hour and a half, two hours outside DC. Oh, we're not busting anybody in from there. How about out in the Shenandoah Valley? No, 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 we're not busting anybody from there. How about in the, you know, the Lancaster region of Pennsylvania where you know, you, you have a lot of remote, no, we're not busting anybody from there. Those are the kids we got to reach. <clears throat> so I encourage you, you know, this is an important thing, but I think it's important to get beyond, I'll call it the half hour drive. Let's get, reach into the areas where there's a lot of kids that we can actually make a huge impact in to try and actually, uh, you know, bring them into the community. All right, so here I'm going to end. So I haven't given you a lot of detail because we're still working it through, but I think it's, you know, a couple messages I'd like to have. You know, the Army recognizes it needs a new future. We are studying to figure out where it is we need to go. I've given you hints of where we think we're, we're headed. I've given you hints of where I'm moving my portfolio. If you asked me to do this a year from now, I'd give you a lot more detail. 
So here's where I think we are, right? I started with this as the discussion of where we're trying to go for unprecedented capabilities. We're transitioning things for today. My RDEC partners do a lot more of what that first box is. You know, we're all trying to innovate for the future, the middle, mid, midpoint. I do that and they do that as the laboratories. But my job is really looking at, from now on, as we come out of war, is looking at how we're going to be in 2030, 2040. And that's where I need your help. How do we actually define what 2030 and 2040 is going to look like? How do we create something that's different than it is today? And let's not evolve what we have. Let's think about what it could be and we'll work our way back to where we're at today. If I think of it that way, you might say, I don't know how to solve that problem. What are my technical challenges? What are the things in science I need to discover or in engineering I need to innovate to actually solve a problem that I don't know how to solve today? All right, with that, thank you very much. I enjoyed it and happy to take any questions.